President Obama has selected three very different men to lead his second term foreign policy team. He's picked John Kerry, a Democratic senator from Massachusetts, to be Secretary of State. Chuck Hagel, a Republican former senator from Nebraska, to be Secretary of Defense. And John Brennan, a career intelligence officer, to be Director of the CIA. I'm Michael Scharf, the host of Talking Foreign Policy. In this hour, our expert panel will discuss what the appointments of Kerry, Hagel, and Brennan will likely mean for U.S. foreign policy during the next four years. In the first part of today's program, we'll examine their backgrounds. In the next, we'll look at their likely legislative agendas. And in our final part, our experts will forecast where these men are likely to stand on the most important foreign policy issues facing the United States. First, the news. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm Michael Scharf, the Associate Dean at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Today, our experts will be discussing America's new foreign policy team, John Kerry, Chuck Hagel, and John Brennan. If you're joining this program for the first time, the format we use is sort of a radio version of the McLaughlin Hour. Our panel consists of a military expert, Mike Newton, an ethicist, Shannon French, an international law professor, Melena Stereo, and we may be joined by Melissa Waters, a human rights expert from our NPR affiliate in St. Louis. Let's start our conversation with Melena Stereo. Melena, you're a professor at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. You've been on the program before, and it's great to have you back. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you give us some background about the three positions, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and Director of the CIA? What does each do, and which is the most powerful of the trio? So all four positions are extremely powerful. The Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense positions are officially among the four most prominent cabinet positions. And in terms of an official hierarchy of positions, when you look at the presidential line of succession, the Secretary of State position is number four. The Secretary of Defense is number six. The CIA director is not mentioned, but of course, I think everybody understands how powerful this position is. And, and you've mentioned four positions. We're focusing on three, but of course, the fourth is the NSA, the National Security, Security Advisor. Exactly. Now, in terms of what they do, the Secretary of State heads the State Department and is basically in charge of foreign relations and diplomacy. The Secretary of Defense heads the Defense Department and is, is, is the head of our Army, Navy, and Air Force. And then the Director of the CIA heads all of our intelligence operations. All four are extremely powerful positions. So we're about to have a new foreign policy leadership, and it could really make a difference in the direction of our country. Mike Newton, you have joined our program before. It's good to have you back. Mike is a former colonel in the Judge Advocate General Corps. He's now a professor at Vanderbilt. Um, Mike, let me start out with a question for you. Yeah, good. <laughs> you know Susan Rice. Yep. You've worked with her back when you were at the State Department. She was, until recently, or and currently, is the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And she was President Obama's first choice for Secretary of State. Why did Ambassador Rice withdraw her name from the nomination last month? Well, I think one of the things that has to be said is that initially she's done yeoman's work uh, in the position in New York. The, the position at the U.S. Uh, delegation to the United Nations is an extremely difficult job, and she's, by all accounts, done, a, done an incredible job behind the scenes, uh, uh, brokering some very fractured coalitions and obviously the very difficult issues. Um, the, mo the movement, to, uh, really a promotion to Secretary of State, um, would have been something that, that I think would have been very much in her, her personal desires and career interests. Um, you know, essentially she withdrew in the, in the aftermath of the Benghazi controversy. Uh, the facts are still not clearly established exactly what her talking points were, who changed allegedly from the intel community to her. The fact is that she went on all the talk shows as the face of the administration, not just to the American people, but to the world, with what were, were demonstrably false facts. Um, but from her perspective, she says, you know, I was uh, using with the information that I was provided, which is actually true. Um, so, so the short answer is I think she withdrew uh, two parts prudence, one part policy yeah. uh, to, to really keep the focus on advancing U.S. policy interests, knowing that a long drawn out confirmation battle would detract from our interest at a very critical point in our, in our relations with all the other things going on in the world. And that seems to be playing out. It, it seems that John Kerry is not having a problem with his confirmation. 
But let me ask you, since you know Susan Rice, you know her background as someone who's risen up through the State Department and has fought these battles from that point of view, whereas John Kerry comes from the legislative side, how do you think Kerry would compare with her in terms of his approach, especially to human rights? Well, I think on the human rights portfolio, it's important to remember that because you're not having a huge change in administration, there will certainly be a number of people at the second and third tiers uh, that are moving in and out. But the structure of the bureaucracy is going to remain in place, which is actually at this critical time in U.S. relations, one of those subtle things that I think is very important as we move forward. Um, on the particular human rights portfolio, in the first term, there were some things done that, that are potentially very significant for things like Syria, uh, for, for humanitarian relief operations, et cetera. Um, and those things all stay the same. Those people all stay in place. Uh, what, what Senator Kerry will bring, if he's confirmed, I think is the, is the ability to really engage with Congress uh, in, in, this, in much the same way that, that, that Secretary Clinton did. You know, she knew the people. There were many of her friends. And that's critically important. Now, let me go back to Milena. You were telling us about the different roles that these people played, and you mentioned the National Security Advisor. There are reports that Susan Rice could be named the next National Security Advisor when Tom Donilon, who currently has that post, steps down in about a year. How would her appointment to that position affect John Kerry's effectiveness as Secretary of State and his access to the White House? Well, I don't think that John Kerry would be undermined in position in his position in, in any significant way because those are pretty much the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, those are distinct positions that do have to work together on many different issues, but that are they're very um, different positions. Susan Rice in her if, if she were appointed national security advisor, she would have to work very closely with the president and from um, all by all accounts, she does um, enjoy a very close relationship with the president. So that might be a that might be a good thing. And from what Mike mentioned earlier, it might be a good thing that we have someone like John Kerry, who has been the chairman of the Senate, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and knows the senators, probably knows many of the congressmen who will be able to work closely with uh, both houses. Well, and I'm thinking back to history. You had a strong national security advisor with um, Henry Kissinger. And that made all sorts of problems for his secretary of state at the time. Condoleezza Rice, mm -hmm. a more recent example, was very strong and had more power, it seemed, than the secretary of state, Colin Powell mm -hmm. at the time. Um, let me ask uh, Shannon French. Shannon, uh, you taught at the Navy Academy in Annapolis before coming to Case Western to head the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. What do you think the relationship would be if someone like Susan Rice is closer to the president in proximity than the secretary of state? Well, I think one of the um, points that, that uh, Milena has already highlighted for us that's, that's significant is that it's not as though John Kerry is not uh, tightly uh, linked to this administration in other ways, too. Uh, I think um, the long history that uh, Kerry has established in Washington gives him great respect, and he will command that respect with the president as well. So I, I also, uh, sorry to be in violent agreement, but I do think that uh, mm -hmm. that, that relationship will, will not, that Susan Rice's relationship won't interfere with John Kerry. And he's a heavyweight in this in this role, and, and he's All got right, big now, shoes to fill. Now we're starting can I, to can sli I disagree slightly with that, though? Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> because, you know, the problem in Washington always, and we've seen it lately in the, in the micro, is, you know, the paralysis and the policymaking functions. So anytime there's a new shift to people, there's always going to be shifting organizational roles. And and from my experience in Washington, working with the NSC and working at the highest levels of the State Department, that relationship is always in flux. And so and it's not just a monolithic relationship. It's always in flux depending on the issue. So it really does come to, down to a question of here's a disagreement at the upper levels. Who has the access? Who has the funding? Who has the people to really win the day? And the trick is that a really effective national security advisor can really move mountains to move the bureaucracy or, conversely, lock us into bureaucratic gridlock. All right. Now, we're starting to sort of psychoanalyze uh, John Kerry. And let me ask you, Shannon, as an ethicist, the defining moment in John Kerry's early life was his return from the Vietnam War. And as we know from press accounts, um, what he did is he threw away his military decorations in protest at the Capitol, and then he testified before the Congress in 1971, and he accused his fellow soldiers of systematic atrocities. Do those actions suggest that 
John Kerry might be more of a pacifist Secretary of State than the previous occupants of that office. Um, people like Hillary Clinton, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, Madeleine Albright. Well, I mean, the moment that you're alluding to is very important historically. Uh, we're talking about uh, over 40 years ago now, uh, the young John Kerry in a similar committee. <laughs> but in this case, um, speaking about his personal experiences, the horrors that he'd seen, and very famously saying this line that, that has, has definitely uh, had some traction since then, the quote was, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? And that was, you know, John Kerry's point in in this uh, in this hearing. So if you think of that as part of his formative experience, uh, I think it does at least suggest that he would be a cautious Secretary of State in terms of committing, particularly ground troops, uh, boots on the ground, uh, to um, various uh, conflicts. However, having said that, he's not a pacifist. It's one thing to have felt that a particular conflict uh, was um, unjust or to think that particular tactics uh, and strategies are, are inappropriate. But overall, he's not a pacifist. And I don't think uh, that he would shy away from taking uh, military measures. He's going to lean towards diplomacy. But, you know, arguably all secretaries of state lean towards diplomacy. Well, since we're talking about people who returned from Vietnam, Chuck Hagel, the appointment for the Secretary of Defense, has a similar background. And let me turn to Mike. Mike, um, you're our military expert. You yourself have served in two fields of battle um, as a JAG officer in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Chuck Hagel, like John Kerry, served in the Vietnam War. But unlike Kerry, Hagel felt the Vietnam War was justified. And he blamed the leadership for failing to win a winnable war. Mike, how do you think Hegel's experience of Vietnam will shape his approach to foreign policy and, and national military policy and the use of armed force? Well, in the, big, in the big picture, the macro lesson of Vietnam, which I think people who were there, as was my father, um, learned intimately, and anybody in any other organ military organization would echo this, is to understand the innovation and the camaraderie and the teamwork that's essential down at the lower levels, that you're the ones who bear the bear the hardships, bear the greatest burden. And the, having experienced that personally, I think Shannon's right. You know, the Secretary of State will tend to tend towards diplomacy. That's part of the job description. And the Secretary of Defense. And the Secretary of Defense will also relate to that. Um, but but conversely, you know, the, the, the critical lesson out of Vietnam, and, and sadly we've repeated it in other contexts, is that the leadership comes from the Secretary of Defense. So both the advocacy for the defense position, but also the ability from on high to give clear guidance, the resources, the time, and the full support of the bureaucracy because that's the frustrating thing from the ground looking up. Uh, and, and what we're really talking about in military terms is, is creating a fusion between the operational and the strategic level all the way down to the tactical and it, level. And it's not just the leadership inside. It's also the, the political leadership. Let me ask Shannon this question. Senator Hagel reluctantly supported the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up being one of the few Republican critics of the Iraq war. And then he opposed the so-called surge. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that tell us about him? Is he going to have the kind of leadership politically that Michael Newton says is so important in the position? Well, I think it's interesting. We're, we're drawing out these parallels with Kerry and Hagel. And uh, the strongest parallel that I see is this concern about our actual troops, about the, the individuals who are going to be facing on the ground uh, what uh, what we send them off to do on our behalf. And I think something we haven't mentioned, which is relevant on the biography side with Hegel, is if he is chosen, he will be, or if he is approved, he will be the first person who held an enlisted rank to um, become a secretary of defense. And that's significant to me because this is someone who has seen a war from that enlisted person's perspective, very low on the totem pole, but doing a lot of the, you know, the very hard work and, and facing the horrors uh, squarely on. So I actually am interested to see how does this, he's also been described as very thoughtful, that he's a reflective person. And uh, the seeing both sides and going back and forth on judgment isn't always a sign of weakness. Sometimes it's a sign of getting more information and, and amending your previous judgment based on the new knowledge. So I, I'm not... Um, I'm not negative on him for those uh, points, uh, but I, he was arguably wrong about the surge. And I think people might highlight that and say, uh, you know, this is a case where the reluctance um, 
may have prevented something that uh, that did in fact prove effective. Well, we're starting to peel the onion on these individuals, but it's time for another short break. When we return, we'll continue our discussion of America's new foreign policy team. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy, brought to you by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Idea Stream. I'm Michael Scharf, and I'm joined in studio by Shannon French, the director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence, Professor Milena Stereo of Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and Colonel Michael Newton of Vanderbilt Law School. We've been discussing the backgrounds of the three men who have been selected to head Americans foreign policy team for the next four years. And we were just looking at what Chuck Hagel would mean as head of the Department of Defense. Mike Newton, you said you wanted to jump into that discussion. Well, I did actually. Uh, To pick up on Shannon's point, I actually think one of the subtle things in Hagel's background uh, as an enlisted man having served on the ground, remember, and people forget this, is that the surge was really a ground up tactical initiative developed from the bottom up, percolating to the top. People think now in hindsight, oh, it was it was General Petraeus, it was the thinkers, it was Washington. No, no, no. These were tactical innovations that were done from the ground up. And to the extent that Hegel opposed the surge, what it meant was he'd forgotten that basic lesson is that the keys to victory and or, or in military terms, mission accomplishment are best understood by the people on the ground having to do it. And then you've got to listen to them. You've got to empower them. And more importantly, you have to resource them. And if he's forgotten that, basic lesson, he'll be a disaster as Secretary of Defense. And Melina Sturrow, you wanted to add something? I just wanted to bring back um, Susan Rice in the conversation. We had been talking about her earlier, and just to sort of wrap this up with bringing her name up again, um, we've been talking about how Hegel and Kerry, both of their experiences seem, seem to have been shaped by the fact that they both served in the Vietnam War. Well, Susan Rice did not. She's sort of you know a generation younger than they are, and she has actually been quoted as saying, you know, why do we keep talking about Vietnam? Now we're dealing completely different issues, let's just forget about Vietnam. So it's just going to be very interesting to see if she were um, to become the next national security advisor, just going to be very interesting how she deals with Kerry and Hegel if they're confirmed on these kinds of issues. You know, this reminds me of something that was in that new movie, Lincoln. Have any of the three of you seen that? I saw the movie. You both have. (laughs) All right. Melina, then let me ask you this question. So the movie Lincoln is based on the book Team of Rivals, and it's getting a lot of attention. Some people have likened Hegel's appointment to the chief... uh, to the cabinet appointments of Abraham Lincoln. And um, what do you think about that comparison? Now it, Hegel and Yeah, Lincoln. I mean, a team of rivals, someone who's yes. a Republican coming yeah. into the Democratic fold. How is that likely to work? How often has that happened in the past? I mean, it has not happened that often. I think in this instance, I think it can work in the sense that Hegel, on many different positions, his positions are more alike to the Democratic Party, the official Democratic Party, party line rather than the Republican Party. So I think he's closer to the Democratic Party on many of these issues. So I think I, I don't see if he were confirmed, I don't see a paralysis from, you know, uh, happening. I don't see a major conflict between him and the, and the president. So, I mean, and I, I'm reminded back the last time that we had a Republican Secretary of Defense during a Democratic administration. That was the Clinton administration mm-hmm. with Bill Cohen. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike, you were at that time negotiating the International mm-hmm. Criminal Court statute. Wasn't the fact that you had the Defense Department headed by a Republican opponent of the ICC something that made it very hard for the Democratic administration to, to break a logjam and, and have a, a good negotiating position? Well, it did create policy paralysis, but here's the problem. It's not just because of the leadership. I mean, there's just a technical distinction. Uh, remember that in Team of Rivals, they were all of the same party. They were personal rivals. Um, so I don't attach much to labels, the personal rivalries and the animosity. But the important point to remember is that these are the heads of huge organizations. The the Secretary of Defense, because of the power and the reach and the funding of the Pentagon, is always going to have essentially a disproportionate share of that power. When the State Department wants to do something, they go to the Pentagon for security, for funding, for uh, transportation, et cetera. So here's the problem. It takes presidential leadership. 
and that's the key. There will be inevitable frictions, and it takes presidential leadership both to set policy, but more importantly, to move the bureaucracy. And that will be the litmus test, I think, of all three of these people. And, and speaking of leadership, well, Shannon, that's what you teach, right? So <laughs> right. tell us what, what your take is on well, this. Well, I just wanted to add that uh, the, the point of the, uh, the team of rivals was to actually put people in the room who would disagree with President Lincoln. And so a lot of this is, I, I, I think it's true, a lot of this is about what President Obama expects and what he will tolerate and what he's going to encourage uh, from from his leadership team here. It only works if he is, in fact, sincerely inviting a challenge and and um, cordial, hopefully, dispute. Uh, otherwise, it really doesn't matter if they're from different parties, if, if they're all uh, either cowed in some way or, or not willing to, to challenge one another. It doesn't create that healthy atmosphere that you really need for ethical decision making. And let me just add quickly that there are very troubling signs, you know, the tremors in the military force. Uh, the, the recent reports, for example, that General Mattis has been pushed out prematurely from the Central Command indicate that some of that healthy exchange of ideas and some of that really vigorous debate of what's necessary to use our increasingly limited resources and our diminished political capital and our uh, diminished public attention to foreign policy in the most effective ways, that that, that may be problematic. Well, let's take our microscope, which has been looking at uh, Senator Kerry and former Senator Hagel. And now let's look at the third important new nominee, and that's John Brennan, who's been nominated to be the um, new director of the CIA. He's currently the White House counterterrorism advisor. Now, let me ask Shannon this question. The press has reported that uh, Brennan has, um, he wasn't put forward for the position of the CIA four years ago because of the role that he may have played during the Bush administration in approving some of the extraordinary interrogation techniques, which have been so controversial. Those are the things for our listeners that you may have seen in the movie Zero Dark Thirty, for example. So what does this mean for his confirmation this time around? Is it going to be a problem for him? Should it be? I have to admit, uh, of, of the people we're looking at uh, in our conversation here, Brennan is the one who gives me the most pause. And uh, you've you've shot right to the reason. Um, the, it's not only the uh, the um, enhanced interrogation, which I don't like those euphemisms. We're talking about torture. Uh, it's not only that. He's also been associated with leaks and, and other problems that suggest uh, it, I don't know the, the full truth. I'm not uh, enough on the inside to know how much he's involved with with uh, decision making there. But it suggests that he at least is associated in people's minds with an era that eroded some of the core values that our military depends on. And um, I definitely remember I was uh, teaching at the Naval Academy uh, during uh, the Bush administration and understanding the effect that it had on uh, the military at many different levels to be hearing about uh, this gradual chipping away of the rules and to hear it authorized uh, from the highest um, quarters. You know, this is a corruption of the command climate. And we saw many horrible things come out of that, Abu Ghraib and, and so forth. And you could pin a lot of of harms to that. So I I'm I feel like he is a tainted uh, choice. Mm. I am not myself uh, on board the, the Brennan train. I could be convinced otherwise, but I need more more information. Now, the controversy about Brennan is not mm. just about things that happened in the Bush administration because he was a carryover. And in fact, he got this big promotion. He's been the counterterrorism czar mm -hmm. for the Obama administration. But he's Mike, also the drone guy. Yeah. Well, let's get to those questions. <laughs> right. Mike, you hold and have held several sensitive positions in the Army JAG, at the State Department. You know how important it is to, to really have a certain amount of good judgment and uh, discretion in these types of uh, cases. Let me ask you about John Brennan and, and something that Shannon said. Um, he has sort of a reputation of shooting his mouth off, right? Right after uh, the takedown of Osama bin Laden, he was the guy who said that Osama bin Laden came out firing like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which apparently wasn't true. He was the guy who told the press that they had captured Osama bin Laden's personal stash of porn videos, which apparently had nothing to do with Osama bin Laden. And then finally, with respect to Predator drones, he's the one who said that in the years of their use in Pakistan, not a single civilian casualty could be reported to the use of the Predator drones. So do you think Brennan has the right temperament for the CIA's top position? Well, who in Washington doesn't have a habit of shooting their mouth off? I mean, let's be real. Um, I think the bigger problem 
Um, and in fact, I'm going to push back on Shannon just a little bit. In, in terms of this, uh, the, the DCI, which is the Director of Central Intelligence, if not John Brennan, then who? Critically important time in the life of the agency, having just been through the scandal that they've just been through, having just had a cha change of leadership. You've got to have somebody that comes in like Brennan that knows the organizational structure, that knows the mission, that really can rebuild the role of the agency. And so the, 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 the public statements you're talking about, some of the allegations about uh, too much official administration support, you know, to the film Zero Dark Thirty, those things to me are very troubling. Um, not so much because the initial reports from the killing of Osama bin Laden were inaccurate, but because they signal this desire to use policy processes and intelligence processes for political advantage. That's a huge problem. But are if you in saying, fact, that's a trend. Are you saying that Brennan was doing this as the mouthpiece for President Obama? or I, that think, I think those are questions that will come okay. up during his confirmation hearing. And to the extent that he doesn't effectively, clearly rebut those and say, look, it is the job of the intelligence community – headed by the Central Intelligence Agency, headed by the Director of Central Intelligence, to be neutral, to be apolitical, to be diligent in providing the very best advice. We are not the political pawns of, of this administration or any other administration. And to the extent that that's what taints him, in my view, to the extent that there are those lingering, uh, uh, as they would say, the redolent stench of politicization in the intelligence process, that's what he's got to discount, in part for the external uh, uh, community, but also to be an effective DCI within the bureaucracy, within the intelligence community. Well, another issue that is almost certainly going to arise in his confirmation hearings is about his very aggressive advocacy for the drone policy. Mm -hmm. And Melena Stereo, you've written extensively about predator drones and their use and their legality and the politics of that. Tell us what it means to have the CIA director be somebody who has gone on record as being such a forceful advocate of expanding drones, not just abroad, but even their use in the United States. Yeah, so um, as we all know, under the Obama administration, the use of drones has increased for both surveillance purposes as well as for targeting operations. And John Brennan has really been the key person to President Obama's drone policy. So for example, in an April uh, 2012 speech, John Brennan claimed, argued that drone strikes are legal both under domestic law as well as un under international law. There's nothing in international law that would prohibit the use of drones. He also claimed that drone strikes are ethical, that's his choice of words, because of the, quote, the unprecedented ability of remotely piloted aircraft to precisely target a military objective while minimizing collateral damage. These are his words. I don't think that everybody would agree with that assessment of uh, the drone technology. And I have to say that I'm with Shannon on this one, that I also am a little bit troubled by the choice of John Brennan to head the CIA because of his very aggressive stance on drones. And, and also, it's been reported that he has been an advocate for using drones, not just in areas like Afghanistan and Pakistan, but for using them in Yemen. We've increasingly used drones in Yemen. And reportedly, also, he's been talking about using drones in countries like Mali. So so for some of us, that, 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 is a, 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 that would be a, a somewhat troubling development. I also could be persuaded otherwise, but, but for now I have some, some concern about well, I this. I think the one thing that the hearings will do is give the American people and the Congress the ability to have that detailed discussion, which we haven't really had. Sure. We've crept up on the use of drones without having that very public debate. Mm -hmm. Now let me, speaking of the legislature, ask you, Milena, to tell us a little bit about the treaty process. You know, the president's very powerful, but he can't ratify treaties without the Senate. He can't get executive agreements signed and approved without the Congress. So what are the treaties that are awaiting approval that have been sort of stacked up in, during the last four years that are likely to be at issue in the coming years? So just very briefly, there are three different ways in which the United States can enter into inter international agreements. If you're talking about treaties, those come from basically Article 2 of our Constitution, and there the president needs a supermajority of two-thirds of our senators. Historically speaking, very few of our international agreements have been entered into via the treaty, the Article 2 route. So just to give you a number, between 1946 and 1999, the United States completed almost 16,000 international agreements, and only 912 of those agreements were treaties. So the other ways in which we can enter into international agreements are congressional executive agreements, where the president needs a majority of both houses, the um, House of Representatives and Senate, or sole executive agreements, where the president enters into an inter international agreement pursuant to his in inherent authority as commander-in-chief. So over the last four years, not many treaties have been 
approved using that Article 2 clause where you need a, a supermajority of two-thirds of, of, of our senators. There's a bunch of treaties that are called treaties, and everybody agrees they are going to have to be approved by the Senate as treaties that are really important, right? So uh, some of the ones that come to mind are the, the Law of the Sea Treaty, some of the Disarmament Treaties, some of the Human Rights Treaties. Let me ask the panel at large to chime in. Which ones do you think are the most important that will possibly now get a fresh start under the, the new four years of the new leadership? Well, understand that this is a process that doesn't just happen with the with the change of administration and the change of people. Every year, the State Department prepares its master priority list, and the president approves that. So there's a backlog, a huge mm-hmm. backlog of those treaties. And, and there's an important principle here, which is that when the United States goes out and negotiates in good faith, and we, we compromise, we get concessions, the other party gets concessions, um, and then, for example, the Law of the Sea Treaty, which is what happened, we, we come back, it gets locked in the Senate, which it's been now for more than two decades. When we try to then negotiate further treaties, other treaties, some very, very important treaties, whether they're trade agreements or human rights agreements or, or any other kind of agreement, the answer is, why should we give you anything when you're not going to come back and accept the legal obligations? This was, this was the problem in the International Criminal Court negotiations. And so that, I think, is a policy prerogative, is why we've got to un- unlock some of those treaties, particularly things like the Law of the Sea, All right, where so there's a huge political consensus behind the treaty. Law of the Sea treaty. treaty. Why is that so important? What's the practical things that we need it for? Freedom of navigation through the Straits of Hormuz, freedom of navigation of U.S. naval forces uh, to enforce embargoes, freedom of navigation uh, in and around the South China Sea. What about Russia's claims up to the Arctic? Russia's claims up to the Arctic. So is this is a treaty example. we absolutely need and it's just stuck. Well, the and, and, and the argument is to say, well, we can do it anyway under customary international law. But in doing that, we also forfeit many of the rights that come from the treaty. Uh, and, and I have to say, for me, in my experience negotiating treaties, we get the law of the sea thrown in our face routinely when people say to us, why should we negotiate in good faith? Because you can't then go back and assume the legal obligations that you have made, the promises that you've made to us, you can't keep. And that's and a problem for us. Shannon, what other treaties? Well, I just wanted to throw out a related uh, point. You're talking about the the Arctic. And, of course, one of the reasons that this is becoming an issue is uh, some of the um, melting that is sure. occurring because of uh, global climate change is actually opening up new routes that uh, were not uh, available before. And these are becoming points of contention. And that relates to something else that I think we ought to at least put in the mix here that came up already in uh, John Kerry's uh, hearings. And that is that uh, the Secretary of State has a role to play in um, issues regarding climate change. And and some of those are international agreements as well. And uh, I think people are really trying to take his temperature on that and figure out where he stands. And there are some environmental groups are very optimistic that he's going to, for example, try to block the um, uh, XL pipeline, the the Keystone XL pipeline that um, crossed. It's a State Department issue because it, it, it uh, is international. Uh, and there are others who um, are concerned that he, he may seem too squishy on that or they can't tell for sure where he's going to ultimately come down on those. So there's a lot of core environmental related uh, treaties that I think but, he's but or think, agreements that he's going to have to do. Do you think with. as somebody who has actually been the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, who's been on that committee for three decades, mm-hmm. that he will somehow be able to do what Hillary Clinton and President Obama were not able to do the last four years, and that is to break the logjam and have some of these treaties move forward. Possibly. I mean, he, he has, as has been often reported, a very good relationship with John McCain. Uh, so there's a, a team of rivals, in a way, who are, in fact, good friends and have a background together. So that gives him a, a position, uh, again, of respect, which I mentioned earlier, that might allow him to, to move some of these forward. I know also in his hearings, uh, they brought up the concerns about uh, nuclear disarmament. And uh, as always happens, you have uh, people with particular interests in their districts who are worried about, well, if this happens, jobs are lost because there are uh, materials that are produced in my state. And uh, he seemed to have the finesse to deal with that and to talk about the practicalities of, you know, look, this wouldn't happen overnight. You'd have time to adjust. He would understand what language to give to some of these legislators in order to allow them to to speak back to their constituencies and, and make this argument to them. So I think that's something we haven't seen in a while. Okay, now let's assume that part of the reason that John Kerry was selected is because he might have this ability with his old friendships to get things moving again in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to the question of what Chuck Hagel 
is going to do? Why was he appointed? What's the role that he has been selected to play? And my question for Mike Newton, an Army guy, a guy who's a West Pointer, is this. Um, what do you think Chuck Hagel's role will be in an American military in an era of austerity, where part of his job is to justify deep budget cuts for the Department of Defense. Right. Well, the cynical answer is to be a political weasel. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it is a political appointment. Uh, and so, you know, you, the idea is that you're just the mouthpiece of the president. But but remember, in our, in our constitutional structure under civilian control of the military, you're also the critical uh, liaison between military forces in the field and, and, and regional commanders, theater commanders, and the White House. There's a critical policy role. Um, there's, a, there's a deep-seated fear in the military that, that Senator Hagel, if he's confirmed, um, will simply become the mouthpiece of the White House to superimpose, to cram down people's throats in a way that's dismissive of the military professionals. It just disregards their interests. And in doing that, actually undermines military effectiveness in a way, you know, clearly it's, a, it's, it's an area of shrinking resources. The question is to do things smart and to get control of the bureaucracy and to make smart cuts. Um, and that's the great fear yeah. is that, that it, they won't do that. It'll become just a political process. Well, in many ways, that's more challenging than even the things that face the Secretary of State. It's time for another break. When we come back, our experts will discuss how the members of the new foreign policy team are likely to respond to the most important foreign policy issues facing the United States in the next four years. Stay with us. In our final segment today, our expert panel will forecast where the new team members are likely to take American foreign policy in the next four years. Shannon, I'm going to begin with you. There have been all sorts of reports about where these people stand. Some people believe that both Kerry and Hagel are two guys who will always err on the side of not intervening. We've heard some of that in our discussion earlier. What do you think this means for humanitarian intervention in places like Syria? Well, I think the, the point that has to be clarified is that the kind of intervention they are most likely to be hesitant about is the actual ground troops type of intervention, uh, a large scale intervention and one that uh, puts a large number of our troops in peril. I think it is not a fair assumption that they will be against interventions that are done by other means, uh, such as the kind of intervention that we conducted in Libya. So I think um, if you look back through the history, even uh, in, in the 90s, uh, Senator Hagel himself called for ground troops uh, in support of the, uh, in the intervention of Kosovo. So that's even a ground troop uh, case. But um, I think uh, Kerry has made it clear about Syria that he's had conversations with John McCain uh, about uh, the issue of whether some kind of, of uh, support uh, for uh, the forces against Assad is appropriate and when and what that support would look like. And he seems very open to at least exploring that. He's very <coughs> careful, certainly at the stage he is in his confirmation, uh, makes sense to be that careful about what he uh, commits to, uh, to paper or to the press. Uh, but he's talked about, for example, uh, he was one of the people we were going to have speak and, and, and actually try to interact uh, with Assad and try to make headway there diplomatically. And uh, Kerry has made very strong statements that that's no longer possible. Um, he's been quoted as saying that uh, Assad's actions are inexcusable and reprehensible and so forth. So, you know, he said that time's past the time for engaging with him and that his Assad's um, the clock on his leadership is ticking. So these are not the words of someone who is against uh, intervention. And I think uh, we'll have to wait and see, of course. But that's not what I expect from this team. Melina or Mike, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really agree with that. And I mean, I, Shannon said earlier how John Kerry is really not a pacifist. So yeah. I, I agree with the assessment that the question is going to be whether we commit ground troops. Probably not unless we really have to. But I do think that he would be willing to support other kinds of um, intervention. And in many ways, both Kerry and Hegel seem to be tilting more towards a counterterrorism strategy where you use, for example, drones and you really go after the, the bad guys, neutralize the bad guys, rather than engaging in a, a ground kind of uh, offensive strategy where you're going to try to protect the good guys. So it's just a question of how it's done, but I don't really see him as, as a pacifist either. Yeah, the problem with this, though, is that there's this sensitivity that, and Shannon sort of alluded to this, I forget her exact words, she said, well, that might put them in danger. Look, for the military... <laughs> They're going to be in danger. Right. That's yeah. why they're there. That's yeah. why you're a U.S. Marine. And so there's a larger issue, which says if you're going to do something in Syria, uh, define a mission, 
define the terms of success, generate the political support, let the military go in, do their job, resource them properly, give them rules of engagement that are sufficient to accomplish the mission, and let them go in, every military person in the world wants to go in, do their job, secure mission, secure victory, accomplish the mission, and go home. Mm-hmm. They're not troubled by, mm-hmm. p- by being put into harm's way. Right. But that That's point, why they're in the all-volunteer force. You know, that quote that I gave so, earlier from Kerry about um, not dying for a mistake is, is what you're highlighting. And I think there, there may even be a reluctance with both men uh, to um, be put in a position of judging you know, whether this is a mistake or not because of their tie to Vietnam, which you were highlighting would not have necessarily well, been the case Shannon, with me, Susan Rice. Let me put this in the context of Afghanistan. Mm. I mean, those words of Kerry could just as well mm. be said of our exit strategy in Afghanistan. Mm. What do you think Kerry and Hagel are likely to do in their approach to our exit from Afghanistan? Are they going to pull out all the troops? Are they going to want to leave some? Who's going to be the last man or woman in Afghanistan? Well, you know, I think the um, the strategy that we've seen supported so far suggests that uh, we are never in any of the regions that we've been uh, recently involved going to pull out every last man and woman. That hasn't been our approach. And nothing I've heard from any of these uh, new leaders uh, suggests that they're going to radically change that. Uh, so that does mean that we are going to leave people in, in harm's way in each of these countries radically fewer numbers than we have now. Uh, But um, I I think we're going to quickly see a clash of this idealistic concept of not letting anyone die for a mistake and recognizing that you're going to have to leave people in these countries, even if you do feel it was a mistake to go there in the first place. Uh, And I'm not sure, you know, how they're going to reconcile that with their own histories. And they're extremely vulnerable in these countries. Melina, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, so President Obama had announced that basically the United States would withdraw combat troops, would withdraw from any combat role in Afghanistan by the end of 2014. So, and right now we have about 60,000 troops in Afghanistan. So the real question then is, come January 2015, how many troops are left there? Do we, you know, do do we withdraw 55,000 when we leave 5,000? Or do we withdraw 57,000 and we leave 3,000? And I think Shannon is absolutely right. There are going to be some troops left and there's going to be some danger to to those men and women maybe Mm -hmm. now. But (laughs) uh, the question really is, how many? And it seems like Kerry and Hagel may be pushing towards withdrawing more Mm -hmm. than what President Obama had originally thought. They may even push harder on our uh, partners as well to to try to uh, supply some of those remaining um, troops. I mean, that's certainly been another point of contention all along uh, in these conflicts, the vast numbers of of, uh, U.S. troops versus uh, those of our allies. You know, we do have some excellent, strong partners around the world. they're going to have to be good salesmen um, (laughs) because they've got some swamp that they're going to have to sell, right? Well, yeah, it's true. But to me, it's not a question of how many people are there. Mm -hmm. It's a question of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's the big strategic $64,000 question. (laughs) Given this decade of war in Afghanistan, we know where we are. And in fact, we know where we would have wanted to be. We're not nearly where we would have wanted to be. For example, there are many, many Afghan uh, forces that simply will not go on patrol without U.S. forces. Mm -hmm. And frankly, there are many coalition forces that won't go on patrol without U.S. forces or U.S. air cover, et cetera. So that's the challenge is to to shape a role where you have a designated number of, of, of troops, but that, that, that it's a mission and it's resourced appropriately that actually does some good. Mike, let me draw on your military expertise on another area. You know, in the Plain Dealer, which is the local Cleveland newspaper, we have this column that's called Whatever Happened To? And this is a question in that kind of light. Whatever happened to the strategic defense initiative, which Ronald Reagan called Star Wars? I think what happened is that they've continued to be researching it and building it. And the question I have for you is, while they're trying to find places to cut the budget, um, is Senator Hagel likely to be somebody who is going to be in favor of drastically cutting the Star Wars? Um, and, and is that something that's in our interests? Is that something in our allies' interests? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Star Wars is a term I haven't heard since the 70s in terms of defense <laughs> policy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it did, it, understand, it did lead to some very important strategic results. You think of the Israelis using the Iron Dome mm-hmm. system. You think of of the, the, the fact that the North Koreans just came out several days ago and said, we are going to intentionally target our intercontinental ballistic missiles to the extent that we have them and can develop them on the United States. So a missile defense capacity is clearly, clearly an important uh, U.S. and, frankly, NATO uh, structure. The, the, the big problem that will be encountered will be in Eastern Europe – 
um, you know, the initial deployment of a, of a missile defense system in Poland, which addressed a whole range of threats, be it Iran or North Korea or other places potentially, um, this is a critical element of the so-called Russian reset, the, the reset, the, the, the desire to sort of reinstigate and reset relations with the Russians. It's not turning out so well. The problem is the Poles are sitting there having spent a great deal of political capital uh, to support the United States, and we've made promises to them, which we're not necessarily prepared to keep. I think there's a larger, beyond just the narrow is issue of whether we can defend places with a missile shield or not, there's a larger issue of the credibility of U.S. commitments and, and the credibility of statements that we make to our friends and allies around the world. And to the extent that people say we cannot trust the United States to keep its word, we have a much bigger strategic problem. Well, speaking of trusting us to keep our word and what our word means. Let me ask Melina about the situation in Iran, which uh, Mike Newton just mentioned. Chuck Hagel has said that preemptive strikes against Iran's nuclear program would be counterproductive. Recently, John Kerry said, our policy in Iran is not containment, it's prevention. I don't know. It sounds like those are two things that are in mutual contradiction. So what do you think this means in terms of our approach to Iran in the next couple of months? Well, first of all, I think so if those two are in, in tension, if those two disagree, for example, John Kerry thinks that we should do something about Iran preemptively or preventively, and, and Chuck Hagel doesn't, I just want to reiterate one point that I think Mike Newton mentioned before. It's going to be up to President Obama to show excellent leadership to, to, to bring everybody together to make sure that we have an effective policy. Um, Chuck Hagel doesn't seem to believe that Iran is such a significant threat that would warrant intervention, some kind of military action intervention against Iran preventively. John Kerry may seem slightly more in favor of intervening in Iran. I personally, I don't see the United States intervening in Iran over the next three or four years unless something exceptional were to happen where all of a sudden we found you know, information that Iran is about to do something, you know, exceptionally dangerous. Um, that, of course, you know, could prove to be inaccurate, but that's, that's just sort of my personal assessment as of now. Now, Shannon, let me ask you, Chuck Hagel is not an empty vessel. He actually is a professor at Georgetown. He's been writing books. He's got this book called America, Our Next Chapter. And in it, he actually surprisingly emerges as this huge supporter of the United Nations. What will that mean for U.S. foreign policy going forward, to have a Secretary of Defense, a Republican, no less, who is a strong supporter of the U.N.? Well, you know, it, it's it's uh, you could see I was sort of chuckling there a little bit because um, you know our relationship with the UN has been uh, uneven. I'll, I'll say it that way, uh, and uh, you know we've had um, people in in leadership positions. Bolton comes to mind who have said you know, deeply insulting things about the the UN and its its existence. This is about John Bolton, the yes. former <laughs> U.S. ambassador to the UN. Right. So yeah. you know someone who who um, uh, made statements that that uh, I think included that it ought not to exist, and now we're talking about someone who has praised praised it and, and the possibility of it. I mean, I do think as as someone uh, who myself being interested in um, military ethics and going forward the the expansion of international law um, that uh, that affects uh, military policy, I think it's important for us to have a strong uh, international community. And in theory, the UN is supposed to be the heart of that. But you always run into the same issue uh, of whether the UN has any teeth and whether it can ever uh, enforce anything that it supports. Uh, and it's not clear to me that um, uh, Hegel is in is or will be in in any position to strengthen the UN in the way that it would make it uh, an important uh, force. So I I see that as a I don't know a paper tiger or whatever. The Mike. Well, on the on the issue, go back to the issue of Iran. If you're Israel facing an existential threat from a nuclear armed Iran, which has said our goal is to eliminate those Jews from their territory, that's that's been the political statement from Iranian leadership. You know, there's some things the U.N. does very, very well, delivering shots, water, humanitarian relief, a whole range of things, elections. There's a lot of things the U.N. does very well. But acting on a decisive, expeditious basis to protect sovereignty is not one of them. But the and U.N. If you're has— the if you're the Israelis, you cannot depend on the United Nations, which has had a whole series of anti-Semitic right. statements and been hijacked in many, many occasions to undermine Israeli interests. So in that sense, you know, it's great to talk about what, what, what the U.N. does, 
But but Hagel and and, a, and an incoming ad- advisory team, Senator Hagel and Senator Kerry, are, are going to have to focus on the precise line between what the UN is capable of doing and what it is not capable right. of doing. And in saying that, I recall during the debates, both candidates said that the UN had been very effective in its crippling sanctions on Iran and that that was driving Iran back to the table. Melina, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so obviously Iran is a very, very difficult issue and I absolutely agree with Mike that for a country like Israel, Iran poses a direct threat and I, and I think it, it's sort of easy for us here in the United States to debate you know, what that means Well, we're not the targets of such a, a direct threat. Um, on any kind of intervention on Iran, the, with, with respect to the United Nations, there's always going to be the paralysis within the Security Council. The Security Council is the only body that can authorize military action against a country like Iran. There's always going to be a paralysis. It's very likely that countries like Russia or China would veto any kind of military action against Iran. And so if Iran were to take it up another step and we were to find out that there's really you know, even a, a more of an ex- existential threat against Israel, we may be in a situation where Israel would have to do something drastic. And, and in that sense, it would be up to the United States to really show whether then we would provide a, a sort of unilateral support to Israel if the UN were, were, were paralyzed. You know, and in speaking about these conflicts between the Secretary of, De- of State nominee and the Secretary of Defense, um, John Kerry is known as one of the most pro-Israel members of the Senate, whereas Chuck Hagel mm-hmm. has been criticized for being too tough on Israel mm-hmm. for opposing the expansion of Israel settlements in the West Bank. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be debating it out, I think, on, on that mm-hmm. level as well. Well, we're almost out of time. So today, I think, has provided really a fascinating look at the Obama administration's new foreign policy team. As always, we hope that we have shed some light where before there was just heated debate. If you want to weigh in on the discussion or suggest a topic for an upcoming broadcast of Talking Foreign Policy, just send an email to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. Thanks again to our panel of experts, Shannon French of Case Western Reserve University, Mike Newton of Vanderbilt University, and Milena Stereo of Cleveland State's Marshall College of Law. I'm Michael Scharf. Talking Foreign Policy has been brought to you by Case Western Reserve University in partnership with WCPN 90.3 IdeaStream. Thanks again for joining us. Talking Foreign Policy is a production of Case Western Reserve University and is produced in partnership with 90.3 FM WCPN IdeaStream. Questions and comments about the topics discussed on the show or to suggest future topics, go to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. That's Talking Foreign Policy, all one word, at case.edu.